Hello everyone and welcome to Being Black in Britain, the podcast that captures the nature and the essence of the black experience across the UK, starting with the north of England. Today I am joined by Nihad, who is a trainee clinical psychologist based in Liverpool. Let's get going. Nihad, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Um, I'm really excited to just explore your journey, um, what you do, how you are contributing to uh, the community, specifically in Liverpool, um, and where you see sort of your career journey taking you, um, and just really zooming in on who you are and what, what life or career looks like through your lens. So could you start by just introducing yourself? Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Sure, sure. Okay. Well, thank you for having me also. <laughs> Very well. Um, I'm Nihad. I am a qualified CBT therapist and I'm also um, a trainee clinical psychologist. Okay. Um, what do I do? Psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess a, a big part of, of training is to not just be in, in uni, uni and in teaching to really mm. learn about a whole host of different models, different theories, um, different aspects of research, yeah. um, but also really being quite immersed within different placement settings and right. services to, I guess, really understand what it really means to become a psychologist and to be a psychologist yeah. within the NHS. Yeah. Um, so yeah, p- big part of training involves, you know, being in a diverse range of different um, s- services, organisations mm. and spaces mm. um, to really, I guess, learn about the role and really begin that process of, engaging in therapeutic work working with you know um multidisciplinary teams mm. um massive part of community work also which is hugely important and i'm sure we'll touch a little bit of more course, on that in a moment yeah, yeah. um but yeah that's i guess that's that's a very brief spiel yeah yeah <laughs> but thank that's you pretty for much that. it. thank yeah. you for keeping it very concise no problem at all <laughs> um but zooming in on that then who who do you work with who are your clients or service users that you engage with on a daily basis okay so it varies i guess depending on the type of service or the type of organization that you're working within um so at the moment I am working specifically with children um I've just finished about six months of working with um children with with learning disabilities um neurodevelopmental difficulties um and a whole range of of other um mental health challenges and difficulties also right um but I'm now moving into I guess what we call more core child work um which may still have that um learning disability and neuro um aspect to it but a bit more focused on, I guess, and I hate the word, but core mental health conditions. Right. right. Um, so yeah, that, that's where I'm at, at the moment. So based on, I guess, like I said, the different services and organisations that you're with, your work's going to be focused very differently. So right. it might even vary in terms of the lens that you take and focus of the young person, if it's a child service versus a whole family system, if it's a mm. family therapy service mm. versus, um, I don't know, <sighs> what's another example a forensic setting maybe right. um it might even be more leadership roles um it, it literally ranges so much because I guess one of the things that I've learned about the role of a psychologist is that it's so diverse like mm. there's just not one particular thing that you do it oh, isn't yeah. just the one-to-one work that you're doing um you're working a lot with developing services developing teams um systems and mm. yeah it's really quite eclectic and yeah really fun brilliant <laughs> brilliant and how did you arrive in this profession and how why but that's a big Why question, did you isn't choose it? psychology? I, you know what? I've been I've been thinking about this more recently because yeah. as part of training, you have a lot of supervision um, right. to really make sense of your identity, who mm. you are, where you come from, what your beliefs are, your values, and how that influences on the work that you you carry yeah. out with people. Yeah. Um. And I um I was born in Ghana. Um. I came here with my mum to join my dad, who was training as an S right. when I was about seven years old. Okay. Um. And they both work within the mental health, well, the, okay. the health sector, the health mm-hmm. field. So there's always been, I guess, a, a sense and value of caring within yeah. the family. Beautiful. Um. And I guess in terms of where it's come from. <laughs> It's really hard to say because I was really young when I was in Ghana. So mm. I don't quite remember exactly whether there was like a moment of like, okay, this is, this is be. it. Exactly. I was tiny, so mm. I wouldn't have known. But I also, I mean, because we visit quite often, I've, I've always noticed differences in terms of poverty, mm-hmm. differences, differences in terms of um, access to services, mm. access to care, mm. even, I guess, quite young, always noticing that, you know, some people are happy and some people are not, mm. really wanting to understand what that what that means, why is that, what happens in the yeah. world, what happens in people's lives, that yep. leads to differences in who we are. Mm. Um, and I guess that was probably the moment in which that interest maybe okay. began. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I guess just, just studying psychology, A-level and I think GCSE as well, maybe. Mm. 
I slept since then. <laughs> so it's been a while. <laughs> but it's always been an interest. I've always been interested yeah, in people yeah. and liked to, to have conversations and just learn. Um, okay. So yeah. I'll have that. I'll have that. And Thank you. <laughs> in terms of the demographic then of um, the field that you function in, being specific, you being in Liverpool in the Northwest, what does that look like and how does that impact yourself and the, your way of working and engaging with the field? Okay. Hmm. So this can, I can, I, I can, I can think about a couple of examples when I think about this and I wonder yeah. whether, I guess, thinking about my, my professional role is probably yeah. going to make more sense in terms of responding to that answer. All right, go on. And I think when it comes to working within these services, one of the things that I often reflect on within supervision and, and think about when it comes to start, starting um, placement and ending placement is mm. about the diversity of the um, service users that we have. Yeah. And as you can imagine, they are predominantly um, white people that we mm-hmm. have, um, white mm-hmm. service users. Um, and there's, there's definitely a lack of representation mm. or I guess... Yeah, I'd say represent. I guess that's the right word, isn't it? We don't really see. We don't visibility. Really see as, exactly, it's the visibility as well, isn't it? We don't really see many people who are from, I guess, more minoritized groups. And I feel like that's changing. It's okay. definitely changing. It's, we're definitely seeing a little Slowly bit more of that surely. now. Slowly but surely, absolutely. But it's always something that I reflect on at the end of, of, of placement because one of the questions that they ask is how much work have you done with people from diverse populations? Right. How much work have you done with people who have an identity of difference in yeah. some way yeah um and that can range in in, in multiple different yeah. i guess um spheres really but it's not it's not something that is really seen and mm. i'm very very conscious of it and very aware of it being a black person myself yeah. um and i guess it makes me also then reflect on what it is that needs to be done what it okay. is that we need to do to enable us to access these communities and mm. access these minoritized groups potentially and find out what their needs are really. I guess mm. there's always that question of what, what is it, what is it that we need to do and that desperation to find answers. But I guess we can't really find those answers if we don't actually ask the people themselves what it yeah. is that they need to understand yeah. what psychology is, what what psychology looks like mm. um, and what it is that we can do to help them to, to come and, you know, um, access that support that they deserve to yeah. have. Yeah. Um, so I guess in terms of my role, it feels really empowering but also really conflicting because it's 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 sad to see but it's Mm. also really empowering to feel able to be in a position whereby I can um be involved in these conversations because they're hard conversations to have they're uncomfortable conversations to have but Mm. they're also really important conversations to have um necessary absolutely so yeah definitely feel in a very empowering role but also absolutely very conflicted in that feeling of just real sadness because I know that there's a population as a community out there mm. who are desperate for the support that is out mm. there and, mm. and the support that can be provided they just don't know how and um, they just don't understand it they're also quite scared mm. <laughs> of, of mm. what that might look like and mm. um, not just within their communities but also within the actual care that they receive right, right. Um, so there's a, an avoidance there also because yeah. of the fear and um, because of the uncertainty that I think we've got a massive role to play in terms mm. of enhancing that understanding for mm. sure and then I guess zooming in on that then my question then becomes have you identified any potential sort of factors or barriers um, that are sort of standing in the way of certain minority groups accessing services are there anything any areas that you think actually it's because of these processes it's because of a b c or d Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but is there anything that comes to your attention when Mm -hmm. you think what is stopping Mm -hmm. said groups from accessing this service absolutely absolutely there's numerous Mm -hmm. there's so many different things i think top three just a couple okay top three i would say number one is fear Okay. Like I mentioned, I think fear is is huge. Number two is a lack of understanding mm. of what the what the what the services actually are, what psychology yeah. actually is, what therapy actually is, what that involves and that entails. And I'd say thirdly, and this is something that I'm actually um really really thinking about and considering also is the fact that there isn't. I guess when we think about minoritized groups and communities, mm. and we think about accessing them the way in which we do it is going to be very different for all different cultures, all different communities. And I find that when there's a community, let's say, for example, I don't know, when we think about black, the black community, for example, Mm. it's a massive assumption to make, but there are a lot of black people who are also religious, who are Christian, Muslim, um, whatever it may be. And I guess when we think about 
how we can access that population in itself. Yeah. We're not thinking about how we can speak to people like church leaders. Yeah. Um, we can, we're not thinking about how we can ensure that the language that we use, yeah. for example, within this, um, within the field of Christianity, for example, the language that we use shouldn't necessarily highlight that psychology supersedes their religion yeah. or is above their God. Yeah. And I guess there's that sense of people potentially making psychology like the all the answering thing yeah, like yeah. the thing that's going to fix everything for you mm. and um for some people who are really religious that's their god yeah so we need to really understand that and have that that cultural competence and that cultural sensitivity to make sense of the fact that the language that we use has to be different and mm. has to you know be it, it's going to land differently for different people mm. so if we want to if we want to really engage with them and really enable them to recognize that fear um and really change that sense of uncertainty we need to speak their language almost and the way to do that is to actually be there to go into these communities to be part of them in a way that we in whatever way that we can whatever capacity that we can mm. and also be curious like mm. be willing to learn be willing to understand and be willing to have our minds changed be mm. willing to have hard conversations um in order to enable these people no matter what group that they're from to to have to have those yeah. those those understandings and that support it's crazy because as, as you're saying that my, my head's spinning I'm thinking okay so how do you then convince I don't know this particular staff team how do I convince my colleagues that they need to develop this level of cultural literacy this vocabulary this understanding of this whole entire this very specific mm. demographic mm. in order to reach them mm. because as you were saying there in terms of language and how communicating your service can either it can be welcomed by a community or it can be completely rejected because what you're presenting is almost an offence. Because as you were saying that there, I was thinking, okay, being from a Christian background, if if we had somebody from the NHS stepping into our church one Sunday morning and saying, hi, we have this service to offer you guys and this is going to solve X problems. Absolutely. All the aunties would be like, get thee behind me, Satan. You to, you, absolutely. You need to They'd leave. be like, exactly. you think you're going to come into this house of God absolutely. and tell us that like, you're going to fix this problem when God is my healer. Exactly. Exactly. It would, it would cause so much offence to suggest that you have an answer or a solution that God cannot solve. Spot on. Spot on. So then how do you then almost offer a complementarian approach that says, yes, we we hold God with so much authority and serenity, but then at the same time, we want to show you the benefits of this service that we have to offer. Absolutely. Like how how do you speak both languages Absolutely. without cords and fence? Absolutely. And that's a, that's that's the that's the most important question really, isn't it, to consider? And I guess <clears throat> When I think about that, it makes me wonder whether actually we we almost complicate it by believing that we by, by almost stepping into these spaces with these preconceptions. Mm. And actually, what our job is probably to do is to ask. Yeah, just to ask. You know, when I'm here, how does it make you feel? When mm-hmm. I use this language, what does it mean for you? Yeah, how can I make sure that I don't offend you? Yeah, what's the best way in which I can communicate with you here? Mm-hmm. Like you, like exactly like you said, it is it the worst thing that you can do, especially when it comes to a religious context, is to suggest that psychology or um, that therapeutic support supersedes anybody's god. Yeah, yeah. that's it's awful. Offensive. It's a completely <laughs> offensive. You should never do that. Mm-hmm. And what you should do instead is to talk about the importance of that in regards to support, mm. to navigating emotions, mm. to navigating trauma, to navigating self awareness, mm. understanding to potentially even enhance that relationship yeah. with their God, yeah. you know, rather than this being the answer. Mm. It should never be about that. So I guess taking that out of that context and thinking about, you know, schools and, yeah. you know, prisons and yeah. all sorts of different contexts. Every group. We have to enter these spaces with curiosity. We have to enter them. Being aware of our power, because mm. that's what it is, isn't it? It's mm. being aware about of, 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 you know, what power you hold, but also ensuring that you empower others within that. Yeah sharing within yeah. that communication within that within that joint space almost yeah. Yeah. you should never take people's power away and Absolutely if you not. step into someone's space like their church for yeah. example you are completely doing that and yeah. like you said it's completely offensive mm. so it's that understanding of okay I, I recognize the power that I may have here I may hold and that I might be what's the word that I'm looking for almost forcing upon yeah. others yeah imposing I, imposing upon others exactly that how can I empower them? Mm. How can I give them the torch? How can I let yeah. them let them lead me yeah. and show me the way in which I can support them best? 
Well, then it's education on both sides, though, isn't it? It's the service, finding the language to access and reach the communities, but it's also educating the communities to understand the language of the service. Exactly. Deliverer, exactly. giver. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think it always starts with others. I yeah. think it's got to start with you you're holding the lens of, okay, you, you matter. Mm. You know, these services are important, but actually they're designed to serve you. Yeah. <laughs> so how can we come up with these policies, these rules, these protocols, these methods, these theories, these yeah. models without considering you, yeah. you know, yeah. how can we actually ensure that you're part of the mm. development of those things? Mm. Um, and I guess that, that, that works in every layer really, doesn't it? Absolutely. Oh, my head's spinning. Think about this, <laughs> right. Stay on task, Chad. <laughs> okay. So, okay. In light of that then as well, kind of thinking about where we are at now, specifically in the UK, post George Floyd, post pandemic, what has the field of clinical psychology looked like for you in that kind of recovery mm -hmm, mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. the pandemic? So what, what was that journey there? What what did that look like? Mm -hmm. And what does it look like now? Mm -hmm. And maybe what is the future then and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the field? Absolutely. Looking at what, what you've seen maybe anecdotally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess one of the words that I remember using earlier was being uncared for by people who are supposed to protect mm. you and when we think about George Floyd when we think about that significant period of time yeah that was the narrative wasn't it yeah you know people are professionals are here to protect me mm -hmm. to keep me safe but they're not doing that yeah and that just isn't in the um policing field it's also within mental health unfortunately mm. um we know in, in research, we're aware of the fact that black people are more likely to be restrained and more harsh and, yeah. you know, um, quite traumatizing and, 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 and awful ways mm. in comparison to white people. Yep. Um, we know that, you know, for women, black women are four times more likely to die yep. during childbirth. You know, yep. there are significant health disparities. And I guess this, this mirrors everything that's happening within the forensic field also. Mm. Um, and that was that was difficult that was really hard and i guess it, it almost felt like we were, try, we, were, we were trying to find answers and trying to you know catch these people but they were yeah. just slipping through yeah. our hands yeah um because we, we they were they were scared they were mm. scared they were fearful they were avoidant understandably because they wanted to protect protect of themselves course. of course um and now so so at the moment i'm working on um my research thesis which is focused on the role of ethnicity in relation to childbirth mm. and PTSD, mm. post-traumatic stress symptomology. Um, and during that research, I have been looking at what the literature says in terms of these health disparities within maternity right. care services. Right. And I guess the key themes within that, um, just in relation to your answer, is that there's a huge lack of compassion. Right. There's massive assumptions that are made about mm. um, women's tolerance of pain, for example. Mm. There are lots of um evidence of women feeling misunderstood misheard mm. um even something as simple as their full names not being used um names not don't get me them started not being, on names <laughs> them not being referred to properly yeah. in such a vulnerable time yeah. as well like yeah. significantly significant significantly vulnerable time so you can imagine what that looks like outside of just that space alone and, mm. and really lens out of it and zoom out of it and think about how that looks Di across the dynamics yeah. of, of the whole of psychology in its yeah. field. So what I am hoping to do from this research is not only to understand whether these, these um, the systemic racism actually exists, yeah. what it looks like and the impact that it has on people, specifically um, these, these women or, or birthing people, but also what it is that we can do to educate and support and understanding that isn't shaming but is facilitative of really important conversations mm. about what's happening. Because there's, there's, these, 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 there's these people's experiences and there's the care that's provided. Yep. What's happening in the middle? And what is it that we can do to bridge that gap? What is it that we can do to understand why mm. that gap exists? Mm. And I'm sure that you and I can both probably think about reasons of and course, answers really quickly. Give me a list, <laughs> to be honest. But equally, that can be quite dangerous because yep. if we hold those assumptions, then we don't really give time to reflect and analyse what's actually happening yeah. between those lines and, you know, really ensure that we're not influencing any sort of shame processes occurring yeah. because yeah. when we feel shame, we shut down. Yeah. What we want to do is actually open up these conversations, yeah. really, aren't they? And really enable these transparencies and for these fears to be understood, to be held, mm. but to be 
talked about within a safe space so that we can find answers. And mm. I guess, you know, this comes from a joint perspective from teachers, healthcare providers, um, social workers. Mm. Like there's so many important people whose voices are so critical and so important within the centering of these people's experiences. Mm. Mm. Um, so it's about safety really, isn't it? And it's about understanding. Keyword, Keyword safety. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just want to move away from your professional work. Uh-huh because you obviously have a, an online presence. You have um, the Your Guide Therapy mm-hmm. as your social media mm-hmm. um, profile. Yes. And, and my question is, how did that come about? Why did you decide to take to social media to almost extend in that body of work mm. and sharing that with, with your community yeah. and your network? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Your Guide, I think, was it born, born out of... COVID I feel like it was I think it was around around the point in which COVID was either 2020 it was yeah so I, mem- I remember coming across it like it was during the pandemic that it I was, came across it. I didn't know how long it was before then. I think it was a few months before okay. if not like a year before it was it was around that time okay um and I remember that because I noticed that, that a lot I mean a, who wasn't a lot of people were struggling yeah people yeah. were really really having a massive sense of difficulty mm. um there was loads of loss you know people were passing away they were mm. losing their jobs mm. people were losing their sense of identity because the, the things that they had access to that informed their identity yeah. was completely lost mm. um loneliness isolation there were so many factors that were contributing to people's well-being and mental health being significantly impacted mm. so I thought um well, I felt as though I had a knowledge and an understanding that could be beneficial mm. and I thought what better way to do it than Brilliant. online when we can't see each other yeah, anyway. yeah. how what better way to reach people when you know a lot of people spend more time on their phones connecting more which is wonderful yeah but to find and you know um, access quick information that can be really yeah. supportive. Yeah. Um. So then I remember I did a couple of months a couple of months later um a challenge called Wellbeing Lockdown, mm. which was just like a series of weeks whereby people were engaging in small tasks. So like you know to achieve I don't know five k steps to do mm. some stretches that day to send a gift to someone that they love yeah. to write a compassionate yeah. letter to themselves. You know really really accessible, simple um, sort of tools that they can really engage with and yeah. connect with to just enhance the wellbeing a little bit more. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I love that and I still do. It's, it's a it's massive brilliant. part yeah. of, yeah, the thing that what I'm trying to develop moving forward. And yeah. Yeah. it's unfortunate that I've not got enough time on it at the moment because doctorate is... Life happens, yeah, isn't it? Life is life. Doing, it? <laughs> doctorate is doctoring, yeah. <laughs> You know, course, yourself, I know you the ones. No, I know the ones. <laughs> but it's it's really it's a huge part of, yeah, of um, yeah. yeah everything I'm trying to really share and, okay. and create and support communities with. And and you've continued to grow that that whole brand, haven't you? Because I I saw that recently you've been taking that work into community. Yes. Could you talk about that? Because yeah. I, I I wanted to attend, but oh, I haven't yet attended you. any of those. But oh. for those that maybe are following you yeah. or would like to engage with you, what what is that that you are now bringing physically into sort of the local yes, community? Absolutely. So I guess it is it is that safe space. Mm-hmm. It is that safe space sp- safe space for us to <laughs> oh, can't even speak. <laughs> safe space for us all to learn yeah. to learn to understand and to build awareness essentially um my hope is to grow that in a way whereby we are we have people from many different yeah. racial backgrounds yeah. um differences identities mm. in within a room mm. um and within the with the ones that i just previously did they were based on specific i guess aspects of mental health and well-being mm. so um there's one focus on confidence building one focus on self-esteem loads different different series of, of, of workshops really so I guess moving forward I want to really understand what the community needs you yeah. know what is it they're asking for what is it that where's the gap essentially yeah. and what can we do to really connect people I'm really 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 passionate about the fact that connection can bring about enormous change I truly believe that as as people as human beings if we can connect mm. if we can share stories mm. within the safe spaces magical things can happen mm. and and I've seen it um and it's just it's just a wonderful thing to be part of so I really hope that that moving forward um that's something that I can facilitate and, and really really enhance brilliant and have you got any events coming up shortly in terms of your workshops or are we are we to watch this space we're, we're to watch this <laughs> space exactly because once the doctor's finished doctoring yeah. oh sis <laughs> once it's finished doctoring tell me about you, it honest to god then then, then definitely definitely yeah. um i'll be looking to, to put out loads loads of different events um, yeah. and really really incorporate that a lot more lovely. within communities for sure lovely and i think at a later date we would also like to hear a little bit more about the research specifically yeah. and what you're finding maybe we 
we can we can do a little something sis just, a little just, something just <laughs> because I, I feel like it's really exciting to see that I've come across quite a few black women yeah. at the moment who are all engaging in very specific yeah. context specific pieces of research yeah. Yeah. in different fields that yeah. are really amounting to something powerful something valuable Absolutely. so I'd really love to you know further discuss that with you of course anytime now, <laughs> yeah now finally then because we are running out of time sure my question to you then is for the person that does want to follow your journey and engage with your resources what can they get from you today so is there a social media platform or website or um, portal that they can kind of get what you're giving your yeah. resources your tools is there something that somebody can reach today absolutely i mean you mentioned and it where before. <laughs> you mentioned it before so um yeah m m presence i was gonna say big presence please don't ex expect me to be on there all the time because yeah. i'm really not <laughs> it's, it's not realistic is it's not, it it's not realistic but it's definitely definitely useful and i definitely encourage um any of you who feel as though you know you'd really benefit from that advice and from that support to follow at your guide dot therapy on instagram mm -hmm. um there's tons of videos on there um about a range of different things from um gosh from depression anxiety ocd mm. to binge eating mm. um there's so many different things on there and there's there's so much more scope for okay many 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 more things to be shared because you know the one thing about human beings is that we're really complex and we're very we're very layered um mm. and there's so much to understand mm. and i hope that through my learning i can share that learning with other people yep. um in an accessible way so watch this space like beautiful <laughs> watch this space guys watch this space so thank you so much for giving us your time you had it's been wonderful thank and i look you. forward to seeing you again soon Amazing. hearing thank about this research me. um but yeah thank you <laughs> thank you Thank you for listening to this week's episode to make sure you don't miss the next one or the one after that and sure to follow us on all podcast platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.